Happy Sabbath once again. And welcome to communion. You know, as I reflect on communion this week, I thought I should speak to us about seven remarkable events that happened in the days leading to the death of Christ. The Bible recalls these events as agonizing, torturous, yet uplifting, so that we can have a place in the kingdom of God. So I've called this message between Gethsemane and Golgotha. Our Bible reading is taken from the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And that chapter is talking about the atonement for sins and God's instruction to the, to the high priest and the people of Israel. But I'll focus on verse 19. It says, he shall sprinkle some blood or knit with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanliness of the Israelites. That you will find in Leviticus 16, 19, talking about the atonement for our sins and how God wanted the priest to do it. And you know, after reading that verse, it is safe to say that seven is the number of the Bible. In the Bible, seven symbolizes completeness and perfection. So we find in the Bible that God created everything and he rested on the seventh day. When God was going to destroy the world, he said, take, he said to Noah, take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, male and female. Naaman was asked to birth in River Jordan seven times. And the Bible passage that we just read says, sprinkle the blood seven times. So seven is the number of the Bible. And for us to receive our redemption from sin, seven events must happen leading to the crucifixion of Christ. And I'm saying the events leading to the crucifixion of Christ happen in perfection and completeness. Without these events, there could be no shedding of blood. And if the blood was not shed, there will be no remission for sin. Hebrew 9.22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. It is the blood of Jesus that bought our freedom for us. It is a common thing among us modern Christians to plead the blood of Jesus endlessly, and rightfully so. And I personally love the blood of Jesus because I have benefited from it. The blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Praise God for Christ because he chose to shed his blood for me and for you. Praise God. No matter how much we plead this blood, this fountain of blood does not run dry. Amen. So as much as we like to plead the blood of Jesus, we cannot talk about the blood of Jesus without talking about the body of Jesus. We tend not to talk about the body of Jesus. We talk more about the blood of Jesus. But there will be no blood without the body of Christ. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. 
going back to our key text from Leviticus, it shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. The priest must sprinkle the blood of the lamb seven times for cleansing to take place. It is therefore no coincidence that on the way to Golgotha, on the way to his crucifixion, Christ had to shed his blood in seven different ways for our cleansing to happen in fulfillment of Leviticus 16, verse 19. I'm saying from Gethsemane to Golgotha, Christ bled seven times in seven different ways. Let us quickly run through them. In Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse, 20, verse 44, it says, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So Jesus shed his blood in the garden of Gethsemane. Our Savior was in great pain. He longed for support and companionship that even the the disciples could not offer. Lonely and separated from his friends and his father in heaven, he must face the wish of Gethsemane and the cross alone. He alone can drink from this cup. Jesus' humanity was on display in the garden. He must experience what it truly means to take upon himself our sins. The weight of our sins pressed down upon him so much that he cried out in anguish. If it is possible, take this cup from me. He was separated from his father. The source of his strength. Then, he asked God, can we do this another way? God did not answer. Heaven went silent on him because there is no other way. And so Christ recovered and he said, Thy will be done. So instead of losing his willpower, he regained it. When he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, friends, it was in the garden of Eden that we lost our will, that we lost our willpower when Adam and Eve sinned, when they could not resist temptation. But Christ gained back our willpower in the garden of Gethsemane. He became so weak so that we can be strong. For us to regain the power to resist temptation, Christ sweated. Only this time, it was blood that he sweated. So because of the blooded sweat of Christ, we regained our willpower and have the power to say no to sin. Praise God. And so I declare that as you partake of communion today, the power to subdue your will and submit to the will of God will be granted to you in Jesus' name. Matthew 27, verse 26. It says, Then he released Barabbas to them. For he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. That ties back to Isaiah 53, verse 5, which says he was crushed, he was pierced, and he was chastised for our sake. You see, this whip had nine strands, each with pieces of sharp bones and metal, and a heavy piece of lead at the, at the end of the cord. He was whipped 39 times according to the spirit of prophecy instead of 40. As 40 could have been fatal, and whipping with this type of whip drew out blood. 
If you have not seen the passion of the Christ, you need to go and watch it. It will give you a very good picture of what Christ had to go through. You see, the agony and the pain he went through with, this, with his lacerated body signifies that Jesus has won back our health. His flesh was broken so that our body could be made whole. Therefore, everyone who receives him, accepts his sacrifices, qualifies to receive his healing power. The cause of sickness is broken by his blood. It says, by his stripes, we are healed. I stand upon this altar of God in the name of Jesus, that I should partake of communion today. You will receive your healing because Christ has paid the price. Receive your freedom from sickness in the mighty name of Jesus. He shed blood internally. The beating was so intense that it caused him to bleed on the inside. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Transgression is something that you do with full knowledge that it is wrong. It is willful and it is deliberate. Iniquity is a weakness or fault you were born with. But by his bruises and wounds, we received forgiveness and liberty from the grip of transgressions and iniquities that we were born with. So the Bible in Psalm 58 verse 3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth. Sin is a generational weakness that is handed over through the blood of our parents. Abraham was a liar. His son, Isaac, inherited it and he lied. Isaac passed it on to Jacob. And Jacob lied. You see, the internal bleeding by Jesus means those sins inherited can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus from inside. Those, the blood shed within was to liberate us from the power of transgression and iniquity so that we can live a life free of those causes that we inherited. Praise God, Jesus won back our right standing to stand before God and he delivered us from our iniquities. In Jesus' name, as you partake of communion today, we release you from every grip of sin upon your life. In Jesus' name, receive power over transgression and iniquity in the name of Jesus. Matthew 27, 29, and plating a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and they read on his right hand, and they bowed the nail before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Christ shed blood when they put the crown of thorns on his head. Christ was mocked to save us from mockery. When we sin, we are exposed to mockery and shame, especially when your sin is exposed to man. That is why David said in Psalms, blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. You see, when we sin, we are exposed to mockery and we are put in bondage, which has always been the intention of the enemy. Satan wants to put us in eternal bondage, take away our peace and tamper with our mental health. But you see the crown of shame put on the head of our Lord signifies that Jesus has won back our peace of mind, taking away our shame, and that we are free from torment. The enemy can no longer torment me. He can no longer torment our minds. He wore a crown of thorns that we might wear the crown of glory. As you partake of communion, I pray you will replace your crown of shame with the crown of glory. And by the blood of Jesus, receive healing of the mind, spirit, and soul. 
And no more will you make wrong choices in Jesus' name. You see, he shed blood when they pierced his hands. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 35, and they crucified him, dividing his garments, casting a lot so that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and they cast a lot for my clothing. Part of the crucifixion process was to drive nails through his hands to the cross, piercing his hands, thus drawing blood, which must have been very, very painful. You can imagine what he had to endure. Uh, Jesus freed us to receive our inheritance. He gave us the power to prosper and to succeed. Until then, we could not receive what was ours because our hands were defiled by sin. Satan could claim before God that we were not qualified to receive anything, and it will be so. He could stand before God to accuse us of our sins. But because the hands of Christ were pierced and he shed blood, that was no longer possible. When the blood oozed from the palms of Jesus, it was to take away the curse on the work of your hands. To take away the sin that was testifying against you. And to free you to lift our hands to God in worship. The scriptures speak of lifting holy hands to God. Now we can do that because our hands have been purified through the blood of Jesus. Also the work of our hands can be blessed because the cost that was on the work of our hands was lifted by the wounded hands of Jesus. Now, everything we do, in everything we can prosper. So as you partake of communion today, I pray that every cost against your labor and your inheritance is broken in Amen. Jesus' name. With your hands, you will make wealth and receive your physical and spiritual inheritance Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Number six, he shed blood when they pierced his feet. 20, Matthew 27, 35 says, And they crucified him, dividing his garments, so that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. The other part of the crucifixion process was to nail and pierce his feet. What pain he must have endured. You know, some time ago, I stepped on a piece of nail. It went through my school sander, and I cried out so much in pain. <laughs> that nail did not go through my entire feet, and I still had to shout in pain, and it was just one foot. Now, imagine Jesus' feet on top of each other. And then they drove the nail through and into the cross. What pain he must have endured. What a savior. What a friend we have in Jesus. And yes, he did all of that so that we can have dominion and authority. In Genesis 1.26, it says, God made man and gave him dominion over everything he created. But we lost that dominion when Adam and Eve sinned. But immediately that blood flowed out of the feet of Christ. We received back our dominion. And in Luke 10.19, it says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will injure you in the name of Jesus. In Joshua 1 3, it says, God, every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, that I have given unto you as your inheritance. So, by piercing of his feet, we received both physical and spiritual dominion. So, as you partake of communion, may your dominion be restored in Jesus' name. And may you take back your authority in the name of Jesus. The seventh time 
blood came forth when they pierced his side. John 19, 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance, and instantly there came out blood and water. You see, the fact that blood and water flowed from his side symbolizes that Jesus died from a broken heart. The intensity and the anguish of the weight and burden of our sins that he took on himself and our continual and continuous betrayer against him was so much to bear and ultimately caused his heart to stop beating. He died of a broken heart. This signifies that Jesus won back our joy and healed us of our broken hearts. The ministry of Christ was to heal the broken hearted. The agony that he experienced was caused by abandonment, grief, betrayal, shame, rejection, and so on. You know, medically, medical people, I'm going to say this, but I hope I'm right. Dara, listen to this. That it's been medically proven that the agony, the, the that agony at the level suffered by Christ can cause pericardial effusion. Hmm? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Which is fluid around the heart, right? So, beloved, the enemy may have done many things to crush your heart and your will to live. But when we come to Jesus, broken hearts are made new again. Yeah. For he says, I make all things new. So as you take communion, I pray your broken heart is healed and renewed. And your peace restored in the name of Jesus. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives. And release from darkness every prisoner. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and pains to bear. Oh, what a privilege to know and accept this extraordinary man. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and sacrifice for a worthless sinner like me. We are redeemed by his blood. He shed the blood seven times, seven different ways for you. And we can go home today with our heads raised in humility and our hearts celebrating a new beginning. With this message that we have received, I invite you to partake of communion reflectively. God bless.